Welcome to Heels in the Courtroom, a podcast about successfully navigating law and life, featuring the women trial attorneys at the Simon Law Firm. Hi, it's Amy Gunn. Hey everyone, this is Erica Slater, Liz Lenovy, and Mary Simon. And this is Elizabeth McNulty. Welcome back to Heels in the Courtroom. Today we're going to be talking about preparing and taking party depositions. So as the youngest and newest member of the Simon Law Firm, mm-hmm. I am pretty unfamiliar with these topics. I did clerk here for two years, so I've read a lot of depositions. I've you know, sat in on a lot, lot of depositions. I've even helped prepare for a lot of these kinds of depositions, but I've never taken a party deposition myself. So along with you guys, I hope to learn a lot today. So why don't we start off about talking about uh, how exactly you prepare for depositions, what kind of materials you review, what kind of research you do, your outlines, stuff like that. Erica. Because you mentioned outlines, I will let you in on my little secret that I'm way too uptight to go into most depositions without some sort of outline. And it's honestly, I think it goes back to law school. Like when preparing for an exam, I had to make my own outline and that's how I studied. So preparing for a deposition in making my own outline and reviewing all the information I need to to do that even if it's a deposition that I've taken the same deposition, you know, 10, 20, 30 times before, I still make a new outline. I re-review the topics. I reorganize how I want to approach certain issues. Um, And in doing that, I review all the information in the case. So I will say that's how I start to prepare for a party deposition. And the good thing is that is usually the first deposition in the case, at least that I'm taking. Obviously, my clients have probably gone first. So that allows me to really get a good handle and set the tone for how I prepare and approach the rest of the depositions, quite frankly. Liz, how do you think that you usually go about structuring your depo? And is is it always the same or do you change it up? So it Depends on the deposition, really. What I've found is that you're going to be doing a lot of the same things generally. Obviously, the facts are going to be different. The parties are going to be different. But the same general structure can usually be used. Uh, And that starts with, tell me about yourself. Give me some background information. Tell me where you went to school, your education, your employment history. And I think that those are important questions because it, it allows the witness. And if it is a defendant, then they may not be used to taking depositions. This is probably their first deposition. And it gives them an opportunity to get into the flow of answering questions. And you're trying your best to sort of build rapport with someone who knows that you are on the opposite side of them. So those are general questions. And then as far as the remaining structure of the outline, which I'm like Erica, I I have to outline. I can't go in there without my notes, knowing where I want to go because I have this overwhelming fear that I'm going to forget it's such an important question somewhere. The entire case, in fact, maybe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it might just poof. Exactly. And it's going to be the night before trial when I realize I forgot to ask that one question in my outline. But if I've got it there, I've, I, it's my, my security blanket. So I, what I typically do is just go through all of the facts, and then build my outline off of that. But Erica, you and I have spoken about this a little Mm bit. What are the the situations where you don't have that typical structure of background, let's go through some of the facts, give me whatever your opinions are, if it is someone who, who can give expert opinion, instead of that sort of slow burn through a deposition, going into it a little bit more, I guess, heads on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe you can speak to, to that. Yeah, so you and I were talking the other day how I have changed the way I take certain depositions, and in this case, it it does specifically pertain to the party. I had a a medical malpractice case last year that the error was really clear, and at least once it was discovered, nobody, you know, denied what happened necessarily. And I was deposing the medical providers. It was two of them involved, and I was deposing both of them back-to-back, and it was a, a paramedic case, and I used the same structure I always do, and I kind of went through their background and asked them about their education and, you know, asked about their job duties, and it really was that slow burn. And I got to the end, and 
basically wanted to talk about their negligence. And they completely admitted liability and really kind of fell on the sword in the deposition. And it really surprised me. I think I was so used to thinking that at least in this med mal case that there would be some sort of excuse or something that I didn't see coming. And it really was an admitted liability case that witnesses were completely honest and really kind of traumatized by what happened on their end. I could have really handled that differently because I would have had a different tone throughout the deposition if I had talked about the negligence up front. So now I'm preparing for another deposition where I anticipate it's going to be an admitted liability situation. It's a trucking accident, so it's not a med mal, but I'm going to start with that and um, see where we are on that and then set the tone for the rest of my deposition based on that. What I've found is when I start building my outline, I don't know if, if I'm a crazy person and I do this, but I start thinking this is what the witness is going to say. Surely this is what the witness is going to say. How could they possibly give me any other answer? But then I've been in enough depots to know that they will often give you another answer that you don't anticipate. So right. do you structure your outline in a way to, you know, provide yourself a roadmap? You know, if, if they answer what I expect them to, then I'm going to ask all these follow-up questions based on that answer. If they provide me an answer I wasn't expecting, what am I going to ask? In follow- I need to be prepared with those follow-up questions. So does anyone sort of prepare two separate out? It feels like a sort of like a choose-your-own-adventure uh, book. You beat bit. me to the reference. It's a choose-your-own-adventure novel. <laughs> well, <laughs> d- does that mean, but, but does anybody do that? Does anybody prepare sort of two different outlines just in case? No, I don't. I want to back up just a minute so we can be clear about what we're trying to say in in a lawsuit like this when we say parties we're talking about the plaintiff and the defendant so we this group of highly skilled and intelligent women represent plaintiffs did i not say that that was the yeah, first one i just yeah. like to add highly it. skilled talented i mean in order of no you're right pretty too yeah good yeah. looking okay <laughs> um But we're talking about lawsuits with plaintiffs and defendants generally. That's not 100% of the time um, just one-to-one, but generally to make it simple. So those are the parties to the case, the person bringing the lawsuit and the person defending the lawsuit. We normally represent the plaintiffs, the person bringing the lawsuit. That person's going to be deposed first. And I know I'm kind of simplifying things, but whoever is listening might need to know that as well. So... We represent the person who's bringing the lawsuit, and that person is deposed first, typically the first person that is deposed in the entire litigation. And we represent that person, and it's important to set the tone of the deposition with that party's testimony. So I have different techniques depending on whether I'm preparing my client, the plaintiff, for his or her deposition or deposing the first witness on the other side of the case, the defendant. So outlines are fine if they're bullet points. And the way I look at every single deposition that I take or that my client or I have a client being deposed is what are the goals of the deposition? What are the goals? And I take a piece of paper and I write my goals. I Typically, for a party deposition, you've got two big goals. Number one, what are the facts of the case from this person's perspective? Tell me what you know. Tell me what you remember. Tell me anybody else that you know who might have information. What are the facts? And the second big goal, which you guys have also been talking about, is what admissions can I get out of this person? If I can get a defendant to admit that it was the accident was his or her fault or the the procedure was done below the standard of care, then that's more than half of our case is taken care of. So, Erica, that was your point. If you can get someone to admit any element of your case right out of the box, that's going to shorten how you proceed with the deposition, right. but also how you proceed with the entire case. Right. So you have to know your goals. And if the goal, based on what you know so far, is that you think you can get this defendant to admit some of your case, then that's, you have to get there. Now, how you get there and when you get there, it's a matter of style, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think there's anything wrong with going through a very um, general background education training uh, employment and then getting to the ultimate questions. I think it's uh, sometimes very useful to build a rapport. I find that even in sophisticated litigation, the defendant, even if that person's a physician or a corporate representative, has a certain amount of anxiety just sitting at the table. Um, and you can do two things with that. You can poke at it and come at them pretty hard, or you can build a rapport and have that person, to a certain extent, trust you. I'm more comfortable with that. It just fits my personality better. I'm nice and time provoked, and if the other person on the other side of the table is going to provoke, provoke me, then we can go that way. I mean, I'll go there. It's just not going to be my first choice. So preparing for a party deposition, if that party is the de defendant, you have to sit down, you have to know your case, and you have to know your goals for the case. And I think it's great to have an outline, but if I catch anybody reading from their outline, <laughs> I will haunt you. I will haunt you. Well, and I think that's important, too, because I, in when I get into a deposition, I feel like I hardly look at my outline. Like, I use that's it kind exactly, of as my That's exactly notepad. the goal. But, and, and I think that just the way you organize your outline should be by heading, even... Like, I jot down things under the heading as far as, like, don't forget X, Y, Z. But it's really, like, one heading per page, and then I can flip through it at the end. That's when they come in handy. When you think you're done with your questions, you flip through your outline, and I don't know, maybe one in five times, I'm like, oh, yeah, I completely forgot that whole area. And I think we've been in depositions where people are reading questions from their outline, and had a lot of discussions about that. So two things about that. If the person taking your client or your expert's deposition shows up with an outline, two things. Number one, it's a happy day and a sad day. It's a happy day because typically, not all the time, but typically that person is going, if it's detailed outline, that pe person's going to read those questions and not be an active listener which is the number one goal of the entire exercise, listening to what that person is telling you and formulating your questions in response to that answer. And then you can re refer to your um, bullet points at the end. The second thing is it's gonna, you're going to be there longer than you want to be because they're just checking the boxes, so to speak, going through that outline. And if they're really listening to the answers, you can probably skip 12 pages because either they've admitted something um, or they're just going to complete it because they're terrified the person reading the deposition is going to say, why didn't you ask this question? So I have seen that many, many times over the years. And when someone walks in with a big, thick outline, I'm both happy and sad. And, but, but I also pull my expert or my client aside and I say, all right, they're not really, and this is not 100% true, but typically, if they've got that outline to get through, they're not really listening to what you're saying. So just keep that in mind and just answer as briefly as you can because there sometimes isn't even any follow-up to an answer that's not 100% responsive to the question. So, Amy, I think it's so – I'm so obviously a product of learning from my dad and you because even before you started talking about depositions, what I had written down was – logistics of the depot, tone of the depot, and substance, and elements of the case. Do they have policies and procedures if that calls for it? What's their version of what happened, and what names do they know of people who were involved? And it's verbatim almost what I saw you, you just checking, said. checking, checking things off over there. Checked my boxes because everything you said, I was like, <laughs> I was like yep, yeah. got it, got it, got it. I've <laughs> learned something in the last two and a half years that I've been uh, practicing. So I, I echo every single thing that Amy said because I learned it from you and from sitting in depots with you and uh, my dad, even as a clerk. I think that tone, I had written down tone, Erica, before you had brought up the tone of the deposition. And quite frankly, I've I've learned, especially as a newer attorney, you can have so much fun in a deposition changing up your tone. And the first time that I strayed from my topics and my outline, it felt like I couldn't do it, but I'd seen attorneys in this office do it so seamlessly. And sometimes that's when you find out the most valuable information for your case. Amy had kind of set the stage earlier of talking about we represent the plaintiff, so we're representing the person who's bringing the lawsuit 
That means we have the burden in the case. We have to prove the elements of our case. And we do that by asking questions of the defendant, their experts, their corporate representatives. Corporate representatives, if there's an entity as a defendant in the case, speaks on behalf of that entity or that corporation. And a lot of the cases that I'm working on now and have been involved in require corporate rep depots. Um, So a lot of my goals are not only getting that corporate rep's understanding of what happened in the case, but also what that stance of the defendant's going to be throughout the case. And one of the most important things that I have learned in the short time I've been practicing is get an answer. I've been in depositions before where I will literally ask the exact same question five times in a row. It aggravates everybody in the room, probably including the court reporter, but I get my answer before I leave the deposition. Even if that answer is them saying, I don't know, I at least have the I don't know. And if they say I don't know, I'll ask who does know. And that just gives me the name of the next person who needs to be deposed. So I think the the biggest takeaway that I've learned from taking depositions in a little under three years now is do not leave that deposition without meeting one of your goals. And if your goal is to find out information and that person doesn't know, then you need to know they don't know. And you need to find out who does know. So I think that depositions are so important in our cases. Defendant depositions are incredibly important and make sure the deposition is worth your time. You're there, you're spending this time to build your client's case, to move your client's case forward. You can sit through a deposition for four hours and if you're not sure to get a clean answer and clean meaning just an affirmative answer of whether that person knows something, whether they don't, if you go through the entire thing and they're wishy-washy about their answers and you don't follow up, you might as well have not taken the deposition. I think that no matter what issues you start with, if you go to the heart of the case at the beginning or the end or whatever it is, I think a lot of choosing your tone has to do with the witness for me. If I'm deposing someone who is very demure, soft-spoken, or very sweet, I kind of match that tone, quite frankly. Especially, I'm often videotaping most of our depositions, and I'm not going to go after someone if they haven't given me permission. So I think that when, if you're going to start with the heart of your case, or if, you know, you're going to ask if, you know, they believe it's their fault, or if they're admitting liability, I think you can still do that in a very respectful tone. And that's, that's where I am with this depot next week that I'm going to start with liability, because I expect that this person is going to be very sorry about what happened. But I do want to see where we are, you know, at the beginning. Yeah, because you never, you, you never know. You, yeah. You, I think we look at cases and say, there's no way that they're not going to admit liability. This is crazy. Right, right. And it happened, it's happened about a handful of the time. Well, and if, and if this person does not admit liability, I'm probably going to dig in a little bit. As and you be should. like, how on earth? Like it might be a gift. It would be a gift in my case. Agreed. In that case specifically that I'm thinking about, it would be a gift if they didn't admit liability because of what's stacked against them. Um, now, if they take the tone of being very remorseful about what happened, that's going to change, you know, the tone of the case, and it's going to change the tone of how I, quite frankly, how I respond to things and and work up my case because I will be fighting a different beast, if you will. Can one of you guys speak to? the decision of whether or not to videotape a deposition for the last couple of years. I feel like most of the depositions I've taken have been taken via videotape, but I don't, I don't know if that's just a practice that most of us do that or really what the decision-making process is for that. That's a inter- interesting strategic question. I think it's easy to say just videotape everything, but it is costly. And I think really hard before I spend that money Uh, Yes, it's our money until we win, and then it's our client's money. So I think we have to be good stewards of that. And I will, more often than not, I will videotape the defendant's deposition. And again, that's because we're looking for admissions. And a lot of times what happens is a defendant will admit something or get close to admitting something, But the experts that are hired afterwards to defend that person won't agree with that or find some wiggle room around how that really wasn't an admission. 
reading something to a jury is very ineffective. Playing a videotape of clips from a very clean, tight deposition is very effective. I want that option. Do I need that with non-parties? Not necessarily. If I have a deposition of a witness to something that may not be at trial, well, sure. I, I mean, I think you see that coming. I normally do not videotape the depositions of defense experts because I expect them to be a trial. Would it be more effective in impeachment uh, to have a clip instead of just reading the deposition to prove the impeachment? Yes. That takes a lot of technology being at the ready, and it's very difficult, I think, to make that happen smoothly at trial. Sometimes, actually I think oftentimes in cases, we will find some nugget, something that is really, really good, whether it's in the medical records, we found it online, there's an article, previous testimony, something that we think this can really, you know, nail this guy to the wall or, or, or what have you. And Amy, I know you and I have had this conversation where I, I say, this is great. I'm going to ask about this. And, and it's more of a, why don't we hold it for trial? I think it's going to be very case dependent. I think if you believe that this case is heading towards settlement, it might be something that you bring out in deposition in order to show, look, I got y'all. I mean, you know, this is a strong case. Here's another reason why it's strong. If you're not sure, um, then don't waste that evidence. Don't waste that potential gotcha moment at trial because it's just not, it, it's not worth it because juries love that kind of stuff. And as much as we love watching television and watching it happen, it just doesn't happen that often. But if you truly mm -hmm. think you've got an aha moment in a, a potential impeachment situation or showing the jury something that's going to completely contradict what the expert or the witness just said, then save that, save it. Liz, I also think that's hard. I find myself like going to attorneys who have more trial experience than I do in making those decisions with those little nuggets. And cause I get so excited about them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I'm going to get them. Maybe oh, not. well, we had a case. Just have to wait. <laughs> we had a case last year that two weeks before trial uh, records were presented to us showing that the defendant doctor had altered the medical records, literally doctored the medical records of my client. And that was a day. I mean, you're you're gleeful really with this with this fantasy of what this could be at trial <laughs> you see yourself <laughs> revealing this and the juries drop their jaws and the judge stands up and applauds you know <laughs> you have this whole image of what this could be but then you just really have to think about how am I going to make this happen that way and is it the is it the am I going to get the dream moment or is it more effective to just try to get the case in its best posture to settle it's just a case by case I took my first depo by video and that was an interesting experience. Are there any strategies that you like that you would do differently as opposed to a deposition in person? Taking a deposition by video conference has changed my life in a good way. I was very used to traveling everywhere to take defense expert depositions and that it, you know, you're taking at least a day out of your life if not more. Because they're never all that they're never that close by. Maybe Chicago, and it's nice to be there. It's nice to be across the table from somebody. There's a certain amount of efficiency in that. I always think about looking that person in the eye and somehow requiring the answer that I want just because I'm staring them down. Not as effective as it sounds. There is some planning involved if you want to pass exhibits then you have to send those to the court reporter and the court reporter will then have them. And I'll say, Madam Court Reporter, please hand exhibit blah, blah. So that's from our side. Then oftentimes expert witnesses have their own file. So it requires a pretty good relationship with the defense counsel to say, hey, I'm going to take this by video conference. Any way I can get a copy of that file, you know, X amount of time before the deposition starts. And, and frankly, sometimes it's five minutes before the deposition starts, which is when you'd be getting it anyway if you showed up. 
So then you say, I need the court reporter to please scan these exhibits. So there's some logistics that could get in the way of of 100% efficiency at the videotapes, but I have found balancing it out, it's just a better way to have a happy life. Logistically, for video conference depots, I think it's important that if you send exhibits ahead of time that you make it very clear to the court reporter that they are not to be provided to the witness until you call for one of them. That's a good point. Because especially not knowing where depositions might go, you may mark much more than you're going to use. I mean, I often mark like 10 exhibits and sometimes I use none of them. So I think it's very important to do that. And it kind of, when I was younger and took, it was one of my first video conference depots and it was a defendant. And it was a strange reason why we switched it to video. Like we had to get it done. And like the guy split time between two places. And so he was like going to be on Florida in Florida the day we chose. And like they switched the location on us like the day or two before the deposition. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to like pick up and go to Florida right now because I didn't plan for that. But I really have to get this deposition in. And the defense attorney like wouldn't start the deposition until his client had a chance to look through all the exhibits that I had marked. Mm. And I was like, no, that's not how we're doing that because the court reporter had set them on the table when setting up the room. And I said, you know, and when I got to the deposition by video, I saw that he was, the deponent was looking through a stack of papers and I was like, um, what is that that you're looking through? And that's when the defense attorney jumped in and said, well, my client should have a chance to look through all the exhibits before you ask him. And and it was, quite frankly, I blame myself because I should have been very clear with the court reporter about the logistics of those exhibits. So learn from my mistake. I would not, I may not have thought of that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, um, it, yeah. And, you know. Hot tip. Well, I, hopefully most, you, you wouldn't need to be that explicit, but it did burn me before. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're having a, defense counsel that you don't get along with especially just keep those things in mind what what did you do in that situation I think I let him bully me around and it was really it is one of the most difficult defense counsel relationships that I've had in my career Mm. and we've brought it full circle like we literally had a kumbaya moment where I was like I can't practice like this this is this case is keeping me up at night for the wrong reasons and you know what can we do so he really was nasty to me and and I think I got intimidated and was like okay I'm coming back in 20 minutes and we're starting <laughs> probably something like that but it, it was years ago and you should all learn from those mistakes of mine and any other attorneys who mm-hmm. are care to share we've all, we've all been there it's crazy how funny locations can get when you just have to get the deposition done mm-hmm. and you just need everyone's schedules to find whatever time location works for everybody I remember as a law clerk I went with Amy to a deposition and we all sat around an exam table the actual table we sat at was like the cushioned medical exam table ah. in an office we removed the ah. paper from it Wiped it down, and we all <laughs> said, <laughs> oh my God, I don't even remember oh, that. Man. It was at a hospital, but it was kind of, I don't think they wanted patients and stuff to see lawyers and briefcases just walking around. And so there's this beautiful conference room, but they, we walked right past it and walked past another one. And we were in this like back corner and had to kind of step over each other at this small table. <laughs> it was so uncomfortable. But I just remember we were all kind of laughing about really, because we walked past all these empty, it's so nice glamorous. conference rooms. Yes. This what we do is so glamorous. Small room. <laughs> All right, I got nothing that's going to top sitting in an exam room. How many people were you even, how big was this exam room? Well, it was the doctor, defense attorney, court reporter, and at least the two of us. Yeah, but there was, was no really writing people. surface except for the exam table, and like, that's what it was. I remember it because the, the paper, you had to have a hard surface under your paper because it would poke a hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would have been great is if you, since you were in an exam room, if you could have hooked the person up to like a blood pressure monitor the and just time. watch their blood yeah. pressure rise the more you ask questions. Sort of like a lie detector. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything that wild. The, the weirdest, and by weirdest, I just mean it was uncomfortable because I felt like I had to shout, um, was in the basement of 
a city hall in a tiny town in Missouri. Basically, there were no, apparently no offices we could go to. Both the defense attorney and I were located in St. Louis. The witnesses were way out of town. They didn't want to come in. He suggested, why don't we go to City Hall? So I walk into City Hall and I say, I'm here for a deposition. And immediately the person behind the glass just like runs away, (laughs) runs away. (laughs) A little while later, someone else comes around the corner and he very sheepishly goes, hi, um, I hear you're a lawyer. <laughs> Are we being sued? <laughs> and I had to say, no, sir, uh, you're not being sued. We're here to take a deposition. I, I understand you guys have a location where we, a room or a conference room or something where we can proceed with this deposition. The case is pending here, but but no, you are not individually being sued. And and he goes, oh, okay, okay. Um, well, follow me. So I follow him into the basement, which there's no cell service. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and he takes me into their counsel, like their council room, like where they hold like town hall town meetings halls oh, yeah. and things yeah. like that. So, and it's a U shape. And the way the court reporter sits and where I'm sitting, I am ac- literally across the room from the witness. So I'm <laughs> shouting at her it's like an enchant or something. until finally we started going through some exhibits and I got so tired of shouting at her. I just kind of perched myself on the table and just walked her through it <laughs> because there's no place for me to sit and... It was it was a strange deposition, and both defense counsel and I were doing a lot of walking around this U-shaped oh table, goodness. and I just needed to get out of there. But that, I, again, that doesn't top an exam room, but that was the weirdest place I've given it, or I've taken a depot. So I think I was still at my, the first firm I started at, and I don't know, I don't remember anything about the deposition, but I remember this. So I don't know who set it up and I don't know if this was my fault. So we were also in a tiny town. And so we were going to use the public library in the town, which sounds normal, right? It sounds lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So we um, go in, it's very small library and we're like, where is this going to take place? And all of a sudden, the like one or two conference rooms that they had were no longer available, mm-hmm. and we were all there. And there was like a table where like a couple people were sitting, um, not to be at the library, maybe to kill some time. I remember, and I kid you not, the far corner of the library was the kids section <laughs> with like elementary school size chairs. <laughs> and we sat in small chairs at a lower than normal size table. The court reporter had a great time. She was like five foot tall and had her little own like <laughs> little desk home. thing. I was going to say yeah. your knees just she like was up like, to your chest. <laughs> yeah, totally. And we all got through it and it was no big deal. But I was just like, well, okay, should we whisper? Like, we were in the open <laughs> library, <laughs> and we were, like, on the far corner. It was crazy. Crazy. So I have had a deposition on a boat. What? what? Yes. Oh, my God. A okay. boat. Yes. One of my experts in a case was... Uh, he was a human um, factors guy. Oh, he actually, I know you were going to say he was human. He was a human being, <laughs> shockingly. He wasn't a fish. He not a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> so PhD, human factors, and had worked really hard, was at the end of his career, and spent like six months of the year sailing up and down the East Coast. And I needed his deposition in one of those six months. And he said, well, I'll be in port um, in dock or whatever it's called at, you know, on this date in January, fill in the blank Florida. And I had to tell the defense attorney, this is the location. Meet me on a boat. Meet me on dock 12 of whatever. And, and he was like, what? That's I awesome. said, dude, I mean, so it's awesome. ready. So we go and it's just boats are small. Boats are small. Even this and, and yacht. Sickness, I, mean. I don't even know what size, you know, the foot, whatever. It was a, it, it was a larger, it wasn't a dinghy, but it was, <laughs> it, and he <laughs> lived on it. He lived on it with his wife. And it so was it was crazy with their dog, I think. So, yeah. And it was, we weren't sailing. We were in, in port. That's good. But yeah. So I had to like prep him the night before and then go to the hotel and then come back the next day. And I will say it, it was kind of fun. 
Did I remember telling my boys about that and they when they were younger and they were impressed by it then. That's so funny. Yeah, we Did got you wear like a life jacket or were you good? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so because we were docked. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm picturing you in like a suit. Safety first. Right. a skirt right. and a top on just swaying. As yeah, you know. exactly. <laughs> Your pen rolls off the table. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, because, I mean, they are small. These are small vessels. Yeah, I The, the room is small, so. And it was stuffy, and it was raining. I remember how rainy it was. So, yeah. A Excellent. boat. All right, that's a great way to All wrap right. up logistics on depots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's do takeaways. Um, I think that mine is definitely that... You need to write out your goals, and that can help you build your outline. I'm going to have to push myself and uh, break away from ye old outline. I think that is excellent advice. So anyone else? Just use it differently. <laughs> still make it. Yeah, yeah. Still going to make one. Just yeah. Like oh, yeah. It's okay it to make it. it. Just put it to the side. Right. Keep it in your briefcase. I think my takeaway is today and almost every day, be an active listener. When you're deposing someone... Listen to what they're telling you and follow up on it. I think my takeaway is just be prepared. Be the most prepared person in the room. I've found that that is the most successful depositions I take are the ones where I know every single piece of paper and I know them better than than the other attorney. My takeaway is to... Think about your strategy in taking a deposition and the type of rapport you want to build with that witness to strike the right tone in the deposition. I think my biggest takeaway is set a goal and make sure you leave the deposition either achieving that goal or at least getting closer to it. Can I have a different takeaway? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Redo. Take two. I think my takeaway from this is to have the logistics of the deposition itself, the court reporter, exhibits, where it's happening, how long it's going to take you to get there, all of that figured out, and that will help you avoid a lot of heartburn, a lot of headache when you actually need to sit down and take that deposition. I liked both of yours. Yeah. You can have two. Double yeah. takeaway week. Yeah, don't you can cut have them two. out. She Liz just gets, gets two. two. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, I think that's it for us here at Heels in the Courtroom. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, Episodes drop every Wednesday, so have a good one. Bye. Heels in the Courtroom is brought to you by the Simon Law Firm. Connect with Amy, Liz, Mary, Erica, or Elizabeth at heelsinthecourtroom.law.